from our archives, the Billy Graham Classics. Now the ninth chapter of Hebrews. Hebrews, the ninth chapter, the 22nd verse. These words. And almost all things are by the law purged with blood. And without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness, no remission. And everywhere we turn, we meet blood, whether it's a highway accident or whether it's the various wars that are being fought in the world today, blood is being shed. Wherever we look, blood is being shed. And there's so much to say about blood in the Bible. Crime is the shedding of blood. The Red Cross stands for blood. A few years ago, one of the most popular novels was in cold blood. And Judaism and Christianity have both been called a bloody religion or a slaughterhouse religion. And it's true on that cross. Now in the average person, you have five quarts of blood. It circulates, we're told, every 23 seconds so that every cell in the body is constantly supplied and cleansed at the same time. The blood carries the garbage off. It carries off and it carries the oxygen in. And it's the most mysterious substance probably of the body. And it's composed, it composes the real life of the body. And the Bible teaches that all of us, whatever the color of your skin, whatever your background, we are all related by blood to Adam. We are made of the same blood. We don't know what color skin Adam had. We're not told whether it's black or white or yellow or brown. But we know that the blood is the same. We know that Jesus was not a white man nor was he a black man. He came from that part of the world that touches Africa, Asia, and Europe. He probably had a brown skin as the people of that day did have. But the Apostle Paul said in Acts 17, he hath made of one blood all the nations of men that dwell on the face of the earth. We are made of one blood. We're all related to each other. And we all have our common origin in Adam and Eve. Now it's Adam's blood which courses in every man's veins, whether he be black or white, Jew or Gentile, pagan or cultured, whoever you are, Adam's blood is in your veins. And this blood of Adam carries in it a disease, a fatal disease, the sentence of death. The moment you're born, you're sentenced to die because in the bloodstream is death, a fatal disease that the Bible has labeled sin. In Romans 5, the Apostle Paul says, Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed on all men, for all have sinned. And he said in the day, God had said to Adam and Eve, in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. You cannot eat of this particular tree. If you eat of it, you'll die. God was testing man because God had given man a gift, the gift of choice, the freedom of choice. Man could serve God and love God and build a world with God, or he could rebel against God and try to build his world without God. But God said, if you choose that way, you will suffer and you will die. You will die physically, you will die spiritually, you will die eternally. And man was tempted. He yielded to the temptation. He sinned. And by that one man's sin, your father and my father, Adam, death passed by sin to all men. And tonight, you and I, whoever we are, are under the sentence of death. Man suffers from blood poisoning. But so powerful was the poison of sin that thousands of years later, all of us who are related to Adam by human birth still succumb to the poison of sin which is transmitted to us through the blood. The penalty is death. And every person in this audience a hundred years from now will be dead. 50 years from now, most of us will be dead. 
10 years from now, a great portion of this great audience of 30,000 people will be dead. Now, where does the blood come in? God said, without the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness. There has to be an atonement. There has to be a substitute for you who will take the judgment that you deserve, the death that you deserve, and that substitute became the Son of the living God, Jesus Christ. Even in the very beginning, God was teaching man that he could only come to him by the way of blood. Adam and Eve had sinned. They were naked. God slew some animals. The blood was shed and they were clothed with those skins so that they would not see their nakedness. The first murder was committed by Cain, their son, who slew Abel. Why? Because he became jealous of Abel. They had both brought sacrifices to God, but Cain had disobeyed God. He did not come by the way of blood. He tried to offer some vegetables to God, and God had apparently taught him that the only way is by blood, but Cain said, no, I don't want any of that kind of religion. God refused his sacrifice. He accepted Abel's sacrifice, which was blood sacrifice. And Cain became jealous, and he slew his brother, and that was the first murder. And the first murder was committed in the name of religion. And all through history, men have fought in the name of religion. That's another subject entirely. But Noah, and Noah builded an altar unto the Lord and took of every clean beast and every clean fowl and offered burnt offerings on the altar. Blood was shed in Noah's day. Abraham, God said, Abraham, I want you to go and take your son Isaac. I want to, you to offer your son Isaac as a sacrifice. Abraham did not doubt God. He didn't argue with God. He obeyed God implicitly. And he took his son on a three-day journey to Mount Moriah, where Jerusalem is located today. And there he laid his son on the altar, took his knife, and was ready to plunge it into his son's heart when God reached out and grabbed his wrist and said, No, Abraham. There's a ram caught in a thicket over there and his horns get him. He's the sacrifice. I now see that you trust me and believe in me. I want to ask you something. Do you believe in Christ do you believe in God that much that you do what Abraham did? No wonder he was called a man of faith. No wonder he's called the father of nations. He believed God so implicitly that he was willing to offer the only son, or he had had Ishmael, but the son of the bloodline on the altar because God had told him to do it. And then remember that night in Egypt, all the plagues had come and God had said, and the blood shall be to you for a token upon the houses where you are, and when I see the blood, I will pass over you. In other words, go out and get a lamb. I'm going to destroy the firstborn of every family in Egypt. I want you to get a lamb, slay it, take the blood, put it up on the doorpost. And when I see the blood tonight, when I pass through Egypt killing the firstborn, of every house in Egypt as a judgment upon Egypt because of their refusal to let the people of Israel go, I will pass over. It'll be a sign. And when the death angel came across Egypt that night and there was groaning and moaning and wailing in Egypt because the firstborn of every family died unless, unless the blood was there. He didn't say when I see your good resolutions, when I see all your religious credentials. He said, when I see the blood, I will pass over. I want to ask you, have you been to the cross to have your sins washed away in the blood of the Lamb? You say, Billy, I don't like that kind of preaching. That, that's not modern preaching, I know. But the Bible is full of it. And without the shedding of blood on that cross, there's no forgiveness of sin. You can't be forgiven without the shedding of that blood. Let's come to the New Testament. The cross is the symbol of Christianity, whether it's Catholic, 
Protestant, Orthodox, whatever it is. On every church you'll see a cross. The communion, what is it? We take communion every Sunday in some churches. What is it? The heart of the worship is the communion table. And it speaks about the blood that was shed on the cross. Whether you're Catholic or Anglican or whatever you are. When you take that cup to your lips, it's symbolic of the blood that was shed for your sins. Don, John the Baptist looked at the Lord Jesus Christ and he cried out, Behold the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. Why did he use the word lamb? Jesus was coming as the sacrificial lamb, the Lamb of God that God himself was going to offer for the whole human race. And because that lamb shed his blood on the cross, you can have eternal life, you can have forgiveness of sin, you can know you're going to heaven, and you can become a new person tonight in Jesus Christ. I see Jesus weeping over Jerusalem. I see him perspiring in the garden. I see him shedding his blood on the cross. Fourteen times Jesus predicted his own death. He said he had come to give his life as a ransom for many. Remember the interview with Nicodemus where he said, you must be born again. He also said, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. The death of Christ is mentioned 255 times in the New Testament. It is the very heart of the gospel. One half of all the gospel of John, one fourth of the other gospels given over to the time around the events surrounding the death of Jesus Christ. The death of Christ and the resurrection of Christ is the most important single historical event in the history of the world. Nothing else compares to it. If the blood of Christ doesn't forgive our sins and cleanse us and isn't an atonement for our sins, and if he didn't rise from the dead, we're of all men most miserable and there is no hope upon the horizon of this world. There's no hope for you and there's no hope for the world. We're heading toward an Armageddon that'll destroy the human race and wipe it all out. But Christ did die. He did rise from the dead. He is coming again. There is hope. And I find that young people are reaching out for something to believe in, something to give themselves to, a cause to believe in, a flag to follow, a song to sing, something to change them, something to believe in. Give yourself to Jesus Christ who was willing to go to the cross for you and who is going to rise from the dead and who's coming back someday to be the world ruler. Peter said that the blood redeems for as much as ye know that ye are not redeemed with corruptible things such as silver and gold from your vain conversations received by tradition from your fathers but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish. That's how you're redeemed. Not with silver and gold. You can bring all the silver and gold you can get your hands on and bring it to the church. That won't save your soul. You can do good works all the rest of your life, but that won't save your soul. Because you're saved not by your works, not by your goodness. You're saved by grace through faith and that not of yourselves, not of works lest any man should boast. When I get to the entrance to the kingdom of heaven, and if they should ask me what right I have to be there, I'm not going to say, well, Lord, I've read the Bible through a number of times, and Lord, I've preached to a lot of people while I was down there. I'm going to say simply to thy cross I cling. I come by the mercy and the grace of God that was in Christ on that cross. I come because of the shed blood upon the cross. You see, the blood carries with it the idea of life, and Jesus gave his life for us on the cross. Salvation is free to you and me, but it cost God his son. He had to redeem us because you see God is a just God and God could not just come along and say, Jim and Bill and Susie, Mary, Charlie, I forgive you. He would no longer be God. He couldn't be just. He couldn't be righteous. He would have been a liar. Someone had to pay the price for your sins. Christ paid the price for you. He took the judgment and the hell that you and I deserved on that cross. 
The Bible says that without Christ we are slaves of sin. Whosoever committed sin is the slave of sin. And many of you tonight are slaves of sin. Somerset Maugham, in his book, Human Bondage, rejected God and became a slave to sin. The other night we saw on television in the United States the story of slavery, the terrible and horrible story of slavery, but it featured John Newton. John Newton was a slave trader on the west coast of Africa. And John Newton became a slave of a slave. But one day in a thunderstorm, he was converted to Christ and he went back to England and became an Anglican clergyman and he influenced Wilberforce and he helped stamp out slavery in Britain, the first country in the world to stamp it out and led the way to the freeing of slaves all over the world. And he wrote that song, Amazing Grace. How sweet the sound that could save a wretch like me. And he was a wretch. If the Son, therefore, shall make you free, you shall be free indeed. There was a girl came up here last night and she yelled out, I want my freedom. I wanted to shout back at her, you can be free in Christ. Ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. She might have been talking about she wanted freedom from her husband. I don't know. But Christ can free you and give you a free spirit and give you a joy and a peace that you've never known. The Bible says we are justified by the blood. We're not only redeemed, we're justified. Much more than being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved. just as if I'd never sinned. Justification is more than forgiveness. You and I say, well, I forgive you. God says, I justify you. I place you in my sight as though you've never committed a single sin. Totally innocent because of the blood. When he looks at you, he looks through the blood and he can't see your sins. That's the thrilling and marvelous thing. And one other thing, he can't even remember your sins. You can remember your sins. The devil sees to that and he worries you with it, but God can't remember them. He can erase the tape of the sins in your life. And then the Bible says that the blood of Christ brings peace. And having made peace through the blood of the cross, peace between you and God. I wrote a book once called Peace with God. And when you have peace with God, you have the possibility of having peace in your family. You have the possibility of having peace in your heart. You have the possibility of easing those tensions and those problems in your community because you have peace with God. But it was brought by the blood of Jesus Christ. Man craves peace all over the world. The blood brings peace. And then next, the Bible says, the blood cleanses unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood in Revelation, the first chapter. Have your sins been cleansed? This is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many for the forgiveness of sins. Are you sure that you've been to the cross and had your sins cleansed. The Bible says the blood reconciles. Your iniquities have separated between you and your God and your sins have hid his face from you. But now the scripture says they've overcome by the blood of the lamb. I read about a man that was trying to climb to heaven by a ladder that he had built and he thought the way you did it was to put your good works here and then your good works in the next rung and your good works and you climbed up, up, up and you'd finally get to heaven. But he heard a voice that says, he that climbeth up any other way, the same as a thief and a robber. And the ladder fell and he woke up out of his dream in his sleep and he said, if I go to heaven, I'm going to have to go a different way. Yes, you'll have to go by the way of the cross. Jesus said, if you're not willing to deny self and take up the cross and follow me, you cannot be my disciple. You know, we have blood banks. And I've had blood transfusions myself. And there's a blood bank. 
that we can apply to by faith that will take our guilt and our sin away. We've read a lot about heart transplants, especially in South Africa a few years ago. And there were two factors that were needed for heart transplants. First, there had to be a donor. Jesus Christ is the donor tonight to you. Secondly, the patient had to accept or reject the heart that he received. Tonight, you have to accept or reject. Which will it be? There's no neutral ground. The gospel offers no neutrality. You take your stand with Christ at the cross and trust totally and completely in Him, or you trust in your own goodness or something else, which is a false way and a false road. I'm asking you tonight to surrender your life to Christ to come to the blood that cleanses and let him wash all that past away and give you peace and justification and eternal life. What do you have to do? First, you must repent of your sins. You cannot repent except with the help of God. Salvation is of the law. The Holy Spirit has to help you do the repenting. He'll do it. All you have to do is be willing. And that repenting means that you say, Lord, I'm sorry I've sinned and I'm willing to change my way of living. I'm willing to change my lifestyle. Are you willing to do that? Think about it. Jesus said, count the cost. Are you willing that every part of your life come under the Lordship of Christ and all your priorities be centered in Him? And then the second thing, by faith, by simple faith like a child, you receive him as your Lord and Savior and your only Lord and Savior, trusting only in him and what he did for you. And then thirdly, you're willing to follow and serve him as a disciple. Going out to do good works in his name because of what he's done for you. If you're willing to say that tonight, I want you to get up out of your seat right now, hundreds of you from all over this great stadium and stand in front of the platform and say by coming, I want to join those 6,000 that have already come this week and I want to find Christ as my Lord and Savior. I want my sins forgiven. I want to know I'm going to heaven. And after you've all come, I'm going to say a word to you, have a prayer with you, you may be a member of the church, you may be an officer of the church, or you may not be a member of any church. You may be Catholic or Protestant or Jewish, whatever you are, or you may not have any religion. Get up and come and join them right now as they come, quickly. And everyone else in an attitude of prayer as the choir sings. You're watching the Billy Graham Classics. Please call the phone number on the screen right now for spiritual help and guidance. As hundreds are responding to Mr. Graham's invitation to make a public commitment to Jesus Christ, you can make that same commitment right where you are. Just pick up the phone and call the number you see on your screen. Special friends are waiting to talk with you and pray with you about this most important decision. You that are watching by television can see that down the aisles in this great stadium, every aisle is filled with people who are coming, hundreds of people, to make their peace with God and to have forgiveness of their sins because of the blood that was shed on the cross. That can happen to you where you are, in your home, in a hotel room, in a bar, wherever you are, you can say yes to Jesus Christ. He'll come into your heart. God help you to make that commitment. I'm praying that you will. And go to church next Sunday. If you just prayed that prayer with my father, or if you have any questions about a relationship with Jesus Christ, I would just call that number that is on the screen. There'll be someone there to talk with you, pray with you, and answer those questions. And remember, God loves you. If you would like to commit your life to Jesus Christ, please call us right now toll free at 1-877-772.
Tonight I want to speak on the subject of peace. And I want to speak on the subject of peace not only in the world, but in your life, in your family, your community, your neighborhood, in your place of work. In the book of James, the fourth chapter, we take our text. James 1, 4, 1 and 2. From whence come wars and fightings among you? Come they not hence even of your lust and war in your members? Ye lust and have not? You kill and desire to have and cannot obtain. You fight and war, yet ye have not, because ye ask not. Where do these wars come from? People are asking that constantly. What can we do about it? Because it seems that tonight the world is on the very edge of another precipice that could take us even to Armageddon itself. There's a climate of fear. A world seems to be almost out of control. In some countries, they're fa facing economic ruin. In some parts of the world, they're fighting political and social forces which seem to be pushing the world relentlessly to the brink of chaos. Am I a pessimist or an optimist? Which are you? I was walking in the dining room in Washington some time ago and there were two senators sitting there at the Senate dining room and they were having a discussion and one of them called over and said, Billy, which are you, an optimist or a pessimist? I said, I'm an optimist. And they said, why? I said, because I've read the last chapter of the Bible and I believe that God is in control of our world. I heard about two convicts looking out of a cell window one night. The pessimists saw the bars. The optimists saw the stars. But terrorism and war have become one of the sober realities of our world. An American television network recently did a long study on the Middle East on television at prime time, and they entitled it Near Armageddon. Yet, we're thankful that we're not yet at Armageddon. Someone has said, peace is that brief, glorious moment in history when everybody stands around reloading. Why can't people live in peace? What causes wars? Jesus said, for from within, out of the heart of men, proceed evil thoughts and adulteries and murders and thefts and covetousness and wickedness and jealousies and all the rest. The things that cause war come out of our hearts. You don't have to read the newspaper to read about wars or to see wars. There are fights in the school playground, quarrels in your family. Most murders in the area that I come from are committed within families even a tug of war in your own heart. And it would be wrong to concentrate on nuclear disarmament alone if we don't see other wars among men. Racial wars, class wars, bitterness in politics, cutthroat business practices, all kinds of things. Now there are three kinds of peace spoken of in the Bible. First, there is peace with God. That's in the spiritual order. Peace with God. There's a more fundamental war going on in the world. It's the war against God. You say, well, I'm not against God, but God sees it as a war. We break his laws. We disregard all of his plans. And he sees us at war with him. And it started in the very beginning when God created man. He created him perfect. He never meant that man would fight, that there'd be jealousy and hatred or lust or greed or hunger, starvation or racism. He never meant that there would even be death. Man was to live forever in a paradise. But when God created man, he gave him a gift of freedom of choice. He didn't create you a robot. He could push a button and you would obey. You're not a computer. You're not a calculator that God pushes buttons and you obey. You make your own decisions. You make up your own mind. You have a will of your own. That's the way God made you. He made you in his image. 
not the physical image, but the moral image. And you have a right to choose the kind of life you want to live and the kind of destiny you want to have and where you want to spend eternity. Because whether you like it or not, you are going to live forever. The real you, the part of you that lives inside of your body that we call soul, a spirit, lives forever, either in heaven or hell. And you make the choice. God offers you his love and his mercy and his grace and he gave his son to die on the cross for you. But if you reject it, we make our own hell in this life and the life to come. So there must be peace made with God. Now peace with God is simply bringing things back into order through the intervention of God by his son through his spirit. In Colossians 1 it says, and having made peace through the blood of the cross by him to reconcile all things unto himself. When Christ died on the cross and shed his blood, that made it possible for us to be reconciled with God. And that's what this mission is all about. To get people to realize that they can be reconciled to God and have peace in their own hearts, peace in their family, peace in the neighborhood, and ultimately peace in the world. Because Ephesians 2.14 says, He is our peace who hath made both one and broken down the wall of partition that divides us. Christ is our peace. If you want peace, come to Christ. If you want true peace, come to Christ. If you want to make a contribution to world peace, give your life to Christ. And that's the greatest contribution you can make. He is the only basis for making peace between God and man, the Bible teaches. Then secondly, there's the psychological order or peace of God. St. Augustine many years ago described it as the tranquility of order. In the Old Testament, there was a young man that God called by the name of Gideon, and he had a big army to go out and fight another big army, and God said, your army is too big, Gideon, you'll lose. And he finally cut it down to 300 men to go fight a major army. And he was very frightened. And God said, Gideon, relax, I'm with you. And Gideon built an altar and called it Jehovah Shalom. God is peace. Why? Because God was putting the whole thing together for Gideon. And God can put your life together for you. Your marriage, your relationships with friends or neighbors or fellow workers. Now, God does not remove the troubles and the difficulties in life. The Apostle Paul had a thorn in the flesh. We don't know what it was. It was some physical disability that he had. And three times he asked God to remove it. But God said, no, my grace will be sufficient. I'll be with you in the midst of your suffering. I'll be with you. And then we have a catalog of all the sufferings that Paul went through. God did not remove the harsh realities of life, but he gave him the grace and the strength and the power to go through them victoriously so that when he was in prison, he could sing and testify. And right at the very last before he was slain in Rome, he could shout triumphantly that he was ready to meet God. Jehovah Shalom says, if you put your life in my hands, I'll order it. I'll get it together the way I want it together. And if you will let me work things out, you'll have peace and you will have a new life. Now, as Christians, Jesus said, I'm going to send you out as sheep among wolves. Can you think of anything more dangerous than that? Behold, I send you as sheep among wolves. But he adds something else. While in the midst of the wolves, Christ himself will give you peace and he will be with you to help you. Now that is the Christian distinctive. 
That is what helps make us different than other people in the world. Christ is with us in the midst of our troubles and our difficulties and our hardships. We are not exempted from all the difficulties that other people have to go through. I'm sometimes alarmed about a certain trend in so certain aspects of the church, especially in America, which suggests that God will make you always happy and healthy and wealthy if you come to Christ. That is not true. When you come to Christ, many times the difficulties increase. I'll tell you why. He says there are two roads in life. One is a broad road and one's a narrow road. And you make a choice. And when you decide to receive Christ and go through a narrow gate and go on the narrow road that leads to eternal life, you go in the middle of the broad road and you're going against the stream of humanity. And that brings friction and sometimes more difficulty than you ever had before. But God will be with you in the middle of it. The Bible teaches that we're going to confront harsh realities. Jesus said, count the cost. He said, if you are not willing to deny self, your own selfish ambitions and your selfish sensual pleasures and deny yourself the wrong things and take up the cross, what does that mean? Jesus said, I'm going to die. Will you go and die with me? It's going to be very unpopular to hang on that cross. Will you go back to your school and back to your work and back to your neighborhood and take your stand for me? Even though they laugh at you and make fun of you and say things about you? That's what it costs to follow Christ in our present age. The Bible teaches that we're going to have to face that. And man by himself is limited. How are we going to handle it? Well, some of you will say, well, it won't happen to me, but it will sooner or later because there comes a time when we all suffer. A problem can start like that. And sooner or later, we all die. Sometime, somewhere, there'll be that stroke or that heart attack or that knowledge that you have cancer eating at you or a motor car wreck that can happen so fast that you cannot bat an eye and we're all involved in all of this but in the midst of whatever it is christ is with you if you know him because you see there's the peace of god he said peace i leave with you my peace i give unto you not as the world give it give I unto you let not your heart be troubled neither let it be afraid no matter what you're facing don't be troubled don't be afraid I'll give you my peace but in the midst of the storms of life which are always going to rage there's the peace of God if you have peace with God that's yours in Philippians, the fourth chapter, it says, And the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Now, this psychological peace does not come from evading or avoiding or manipulating. It comes supernaturally from God. Now, there's a third kind of peace. Relational peace. Peace on earth. When the angels came and announced the birth of Jesus Christ, they said, peace on earth, goodwill among men. Where did that go? Why haven't we had peace? Didn't Jesus come to bring peace, you say? And all these wars in these 2,000 years? Yes, but people misunderstood. They would have had peace had they received him and believed on him and followed him. But they rejected him. And we have rejected it. We didn't talk about the Prince of Peace when the United Nations was founded. He was left out. We'll never have peace in this world until we take into account the Prince of Peace and make him King of Kings and Lord of Lords. 
And the Bible says there's coming a day when every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that Jesus is Lord. And that day is coming. Yes, there's going to be a judgment for you and for me. You're going to someday stand before Almighty God. Every person here today and all of you that are watching by television, you will stand alone before God. Every thought that you've ever thought, every intent of your heart, every moral choice that you ever made that was wrong, every sin that you ever committed is going to be brought to light. The tapes are rolling, the film is rolling, it's all there, and you'll have to face it and give an account. It is appointed unto man once to die and after that the judgment. The scripture says God has appointed a day in which he will judge the world by that man Christ Jesus. Are you ready for the judgment day? You can be, because you see, in spite of the fact that God is a God of judgment, he's even more a God of love. He loves you. He offers his mercy to you. He offers forgiveness to you. If you come to the cross where Christ took your sins. You see, when Christ died on the cross, God put upon him your sins and mine. He became sin for us. He became guilty of our sins. He suffered the judgment for us. He took the hell for us. There is therefore now no judgment to them that are in Christ Jesus. If you're in Christ, I'm going to tell you something. If you're in Christ, you'll never be at that great white throne judgment. It's past for you. It's finished. When Jesus bowed his head and said on the cross, it is finished, the way to heaven was finished. The way of salvation was completed. Not by my goodness, not because I go to church, or because I read the Bible, or because I'm a clergyman. He did it on the cross. And there are hundreds of you here tonight, and hundreds of you watching that have been baptized and confirmed as I was. But when I reached about 16 or 17, I realized something was wrong. Something was missing. I really didn't know Christ for myself. Something was missing. What is it? It's that personal relationship with Christ in which you have repented of your sins and received him by faith. And he lives now in your heart. But there's coming a day. Jesus said, thy kingdom will come. His prayer is going to be answered. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That's never been answered. But it's going to be answered. And he shall judge among the nations and shall rebuke many peoples and they shall beat their swords into pruning hooks. And nations shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. In the meantime, God expects us to work for peace. We have to do all we can to bring peace because we do not know whether this is the end time or not. We do not know when the kingdom is going to come and take over the world. But the peace can begin in your life right now. You say, what do I have to do? First, you must repent of your sin. What does that mean? That means that you're willing to say to God, I have sinned and I'm sorry for it. I'm willing to change my way of living. The second thing, receive by faith Jesus Christ into your heart and make him Lord of your life and Savior of your life.